Joining us now, America's Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. Uh, welcome back to the pod, Pete. Hey, thanks for having me back on. Good to be with you again. So I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I am a very nervous flyer. And uh, I think there is not enough Xanax in all of Los Angeles to get me on a uh, Boeing 737 Max right now. And that's that's saying something because there's a lot of Xanax in this town. Uh, <laughs> this week's FAA report that faulted Boeing for its uh, inadequate and confusing safety culture uh, didn't make me feel much better. There was, of course, as you know, <laughs> the Alaska Airlines plane uh, where the door blew off in the middle of the flight. Um, how confident are you that the 737 MAX and all Boeing planes are just as safe as every other plane in the skies right now? Look, anything that the FAA allows to fly, the FAA believes is safe. Uh, anytime I step on a plane, including a Boeing 737 MAX 9, which I did a few days ago, okay. I know that I'm safe because of all of the people from the flight crew and the flight attendants and, and pilots to the, the maintenance folks to the FAA who make sure that's the case. Having said that, we believe that there is a culture problem at Boeing when it comes to safety. Uh, so uh, the FAA administrator has given Boeing 90 days to put together a, a plan comprehensively demonstrating how they're going to shift that. That includes very specific tactical things that emerged when we deployed FAA personnel to the factories to uh, assess what's going on and more broad, big picture things around putting safety first and the, the culture and the prioritization that, that happens there. But, you know, as a nervous flyer, I should tell you that, that the, the urgency around this is, uh, is starting with the context that aviation is the safest way to travel in America and keeping it that way. So this is all about us not taking for granted that traveling on a commercial airliner is by far the safest way to get somewhere. Uh, what we also need to do is frankly push the culture on safety in other modes of travel, notably freight rail and cars and roadways, uh, closer to that territory, because there's a lot of work we've got to do on that front too. But on the aviation front, you're going to see Boeing continue to be under a microscope and they won't be allowed to return to the production numbers that they have advertised until FAA is satisfied that they've got a handle on all of these issues. Yeah, so I, I, read, I read that report what tools do you guys have to ensure that the safety issues are addressed to the government satisfaction uh, after that 90 days passes? A lot. I mean, part of it is the audit, like the audit that's underway right now. Part of it is measures like the unprecedented measure that the FAA took to uh, meter the number of planes they can produce in a month and hold that to 38 until they can uh, prove that it is safe to increase it. The basic division of labor here is that the FAA creates a safety standard. And then Boeing is responsible for demonstrating that they've met that standard. But another thing that's going on with our new administrator, Mike Whitaker, in office is assessing that entire framework to say, do we have the tools that we need to be a thousand percent confident uh, that every aircraft not only is designed in a way that's safe, but every time each specimen rolls off the line, that it actually conforms to that safe design. One more question about air safety and we can move on. Uh, New York Times reported over the summer that according to FAA records, the number of close calls involving commercial airlines have been happening on average multiple times a week, have doubled over the last decade. What is your assessment of why that's happening? Is this like an air traffic control staffing issue? That's definitely part of it. Uh, we just have not enough air traffic controllers in this country. Uh, they do a phenomenal job. I was just in a, a tower a few days ago with them. When you go up into one of these uh, towers, what's really striking is this deceptive sense of calm uh, because it, it's quiet, it's measured, but they are working at an extraordinary pace. If, if you go to, for example, uh, the, the tower at DCA, uh, close to, to where I'm sitting here at, at DOT headquarters, uh, they handle about a flight a minute, about a thousand operations a day. And through that unrelenting pace, their expertise, their training serves them well, but they're being asked to come in for more shifts than we should ask people to come into. Don't get me wrong. Uh, if there's a concern that would actually rise to a level that doesn't meet the standards for fatigue or safety, uh, then the FAA would rather allow that to, to mean fewer flights go than allow that to become any kind of knowable safety issue. But bottom line, we don't want either one of those things to happen, which is why we need to hire more. Now, for the last 30 years, the number of air traffic controllers has been declining. We have finally reversed that. It's finally growing. We are finally hiring more than the number who leave. But importantly, 
among the many, many, many reasons why it is absurd for us to be yet again at the cusp of uh, a potential shutdown is that on day one of a shutdown, our Air Traffic Controller Academy in Oklahoma shuts down. And just the way the training works out there, if, if it's closed even for a couple of days, that could set us back by weeks in terms of the pipeline for getting these folks trained up. So I know there's a million reasons not to have a shutdown. One of the ones I'm watching most closely is the last thing we want to do right now is allow the hiring and training of air traffic controllers to slow down and get stopped. From where you're sitting at, at the Department of Transportation, what other effects would Americans notice from a, a shutdown, which you know, I just heard Schumer and Mike Johnson and everyone saying they're they're hopeful that they're going to reach a deal. But if they don't and there's a shutdown, what would people experience? Well, again, the, the thing I'm probably watching most closely is what that would do to air traffic control hiring. Also, the air traffic controllers who do come in. So the training shuts down. Obviously, the towers don't shut down. That's a function that has to continue 24 by 7 by 365. But one thing that will happen is they stop getting paid and they don't get paid until after the shutdown is resolved. Again, if you just think about what it's like in those towers and what those men and women are doing every day, the last thing I want them worried about is uh, being able to pay rent this month or how they're going to move money, cash around because they're, they're not getting a paycheck. Uh, so that's an important example. All kinds of other functions, some of which affect some of the, the airport uh, physical improvements that we're doing. Uh, and that's just out of the aviation sector. And as you know, the, the convoluted math of how our budgets are put together actually means that parts of this department will be up and running and parts of them will not be. Even just the effort of computing all of that is taking huge amounts of attention and time in a totally unnecessary way because all the people here in this building who are working on that ought to be working on you know transportation and all the other things we came here to do. Uh, Republicans in Congress are also uh, threatening to block Senator Tammy Duckworth's bill to protect access to IVF in the wake of the Alabama Supreme Court's decision, even though most of them say they support IVF. They also promote adoption as an alternative to abortion, even though they've tried to make it so that adoption agencies can refuse to work with gay couples. Some have even come after you and Chastin personally for adopting your beautiful twins. What do you make of their inconsistency here? Is it hypocrisy, ignorance, politics, extremism? It's all of the above. And what it is is ugly because you've got politicians who claim to be pro-family. And then it turns out they're incredibly selective about who counts as a family and whose families deserve to be protected. Whether it's a couple like, like me and Chaston who have provided a uh, loving home and have expanded our family through adoption of our incredible twins, our, our son and our daughter, or whether it's so many people who are counting on IVF as a way to expand their family. Now, I think they know how rotten their own position is. You can tell because they won't own up to it. But still, like they, it, it's, this isn't theoretical, right? Starting with Alabama, and Alabama will not be the last place where families, would-be parents, women lose the right to IVF. Um, that is the direct result of decisions that congressional Republicans, President Trump, and of course the, the court that they created have made. They can't have it both ways. And uh, again, a really good sign that somebody's position is terrible is when they pretend that it's not true. Uh, you tweeted yesterday about voting for Joe Biden in the Michigan Democratic primary. Um, about 13 percent of uh, uh, the people there voted uncommitted after an organized effort to protest the president's policy in Gaza. Um, you had protesters show up at an event you held a few months ago at Michigan State University. What have you said to friends or neighbors or young people who who told you, you know, I'm upset with the president uh, over the war in Gaza? So, first of all, I get it. And nobody can look at what is happening there and feel good. The other thing I'll say is that right now, negotiations are underway to make sure that two things happen, uh, an end to the killing and the return of the hostages. Obviously, I'm not in the middle of that. that that's not what I work on. But I know that that's underway. And I know that the president's leadership is, is a very important part of all of that unfolding. Uh, and look, there, there's a very clear commitment here to make sure that the future doesn't look like the past. And that's the other really important thing, I think, to think about for Palestinians and Israelis living safely, each with a state, an actual state where their rights and their freedoms are protected and their security uh, is looked after. That is obviously not uh, the reality that we inherited. It was not true before October 7th. 
it has not been true since. And until it is, there's going to be more pain. Uh, four years ago on the night before the Michigan primary, Joe Biden said that he he viewed himself only as a bridge to the next generation of leaders. As someone who ran for president on the need for generational change in Washington, I feel like you are uniquely qualified to make the case for President Biden to younger people who may have their doubts about him right now. What would you say as someone who has now worked closely with the president over the last three years? I guess the biggest thing I would say is that we have a president who is focused on the future, who actually cares about what our future will be like, not just our future as a country, but our future speaking for, a, at least by Washington standards, a relatively younger generation and our future in terms of, you know, my kids, which is a whole new way of, of, of thinking about this. You know, the difference between uh, our current administration that is taking the most aggressive action to confront climate change uh, by any country ever. Uh, versus the prior one that really erased even the, the word climate uh, from being something they would discuss is, is just one example of, of how we do things differently and how we will continue to do things differently. And this matters. I mean, the other thing I, I think is really important to get across right now is that the gains that we have made on something like climate, there's obviously a long way to go. But none of these gains are secure. I mean, uh, right now there are debates going on. I know, you know, certainly uh, on our side of the aisle about how to go further, what else is possible. But, but last time I was testifying in, in front of the House of Representatives, I was still debating people who don't believe climate change is real, or at least claim not to believe that climate change is real, and legislate accordingly. And they are in charge of one of the chambers of the United States Congress. So right now, so much depends on our ability to advance these policies. And whether it's something like that, whether it is the work that's been done on student loans, uh, whether it is uh, the work that's being done to, to reinforce the democracy in this country, um, it is being done with a view to the future. That's part of what makes me proud to work here. And obviously that's especially true on the part I get to work on the most, which is, which is the infrastructure work. Remember, uh, the last president said he was gonna deliver an infrastructure bill. I will admit this is the one time that the last president had me fooled. I, I thought they were gonna do it. Why, yeah. why wouldn't you do it, right? Yeah. He said he was a big builder, is a bipartisan priority, with good politics, why, why wouldn't you do it? And yet even, even there, uh, completely failed to deliver. President Biden arrived, and by the way, in a way that specifically vindicates his theory of government, which is that you can at least some of the time get people to cross the aisle and do something together. That's how we did this, right? Bipartisan, mind you, <laughs> far more Democrats than Republicans, but a number of Republicans crossed the aisle to work with President Biden, work with Democrats, work with me, work with others in the administration to get this done. And now we have a trillion dollar infrastructure bill, which is itself also a climate bill, by the way, in, in the sense that we're doing more for transit. We're doing more for electric vehicles. We're electrifying our ports, which, by the way, not just less carbon emissions. That means cleaner air for communities, including largely disproportionately communities of color whose kids are more likely to get asthma because they live next to ports and, and the particulate matter that comes out of those operations. So many things happening around the country. Anyway, my, my, my point is, look, obviously, um, I am from a different generation than the president. I also know that my generation and my kids' generation are so much better off because the president of the United States gets up every day thinking about how to make sure our future is better. You mentioned um, Biden's governing theory. He's, he's framed this strategy in the past as, as trying to prove that democracy can deliver. And basically the idea is, you know, if you can pass legislation and enact policies that, that tangibly improve people's lives, people will have more faith in the system and, and be more likely to prefer our democratic system over the uh, appeal of a, of a strong man. And, and you guys have made like huge progress on passing that agenda and improving people's lives. But, you know, you hear this from the White House itself that they're, they're frustrated. The media hasn't focused enough on that progress. That progress hasn't broken through to people enough, even though it's real and it's there. You've had a front row seat to that when you go to ribbon cutting ceremonies. Um, how do you get around that problem, or at least that challenge, where I, I think the theory is sound about democracy delivering, but yet we're still stuck in this closely divided country where yeah. a Trump presidency is, is possible again. Look, I, I think it's true. I'm definitely frustrated that President Biden doesn't get more credit for the things that he's delivered. Uh, part of that has to do with the nature of infrastructure work, how long some of it takes. Uh, how indirect some of it is. I mean, the vast majority of our, for example, the, the funding that goes to roads and bridges well, goes through the states 
Some of those governors are inclined to credit the president with giving him the funding to get this done. Some of them obviously less likely to do that. Uh, there are even a few cases, they've been pretty rare, but there are a couple cases, notably in Florida, where a state sent back infrastructure money because they didn't want to get caught cooperating with, with President Biden. So obviously very frustrating to watch those very, very political dynamics play out. Um, at the same time, we know that, that when we get out there and draw attention to this work, uh, people want to see more of that. You can tell because so many of the congressional Republicans who voted against these projects getting funded, still want to be there to celebrate the projects. So you can tell that it's good politics and good policy if they want to be there. And you know what? If they're there to say, uh, you know, I was wrong to oppose this and I'm glad it's coming and I'm thankful to President Biden, then welcome aboard. Um, otherwise, we're, we're, <laughs> I think we feel an obligation to, to, to point this out. Um, but bottom line, I think it shows that, that, that it does matter to be seen getting good projects out there and getting good projects done. And, you know, that's going to continue to be our focus. And if that requires you know, going there, um, you know, going out to projects is one of the best parts of my job anyway. Uh, and I think you'll see the president out there a lot, too, um, both, you know, elevating the importance of the projects and helping to make sure that they get delivered. I've lost count of how many people have said to me, you know, uh, Secretary Pete's one of the best messengers in the party. Why can't we get him out there more? I know you've got a day job that keeps you plenty busy. Do you plan to campaign for Joe Biden in your in your personal capacity during this race? I expect that I will. I can't really get into that while I'm sitting in this chair because because you know I'm here as secretary and uh, uh, we actually care about the Hatch Act in this administration. I, I know that's not standard practice maybe <laughs> uh, in, in for our predecessors, but uh, yeah, of course I'm, I'm going to do everything I can out there um, uh, within you know the, the limits of the fact that I have a pretty demanding uh, job here at the DOT, which I'm I'm, I'm proud to be doing. Uh, and look, we we also believe that that good policy is good politics, and if we keep delivering in a real way, look, I'm not naive. You don't instantly get credit for for doing good things especially things that take a while. Um, but I also think that uh, one of the best things that I can do uh, on any account is just to have my head down and, and, and get this work done. Uh, you and I got into politics around the same time. Did you ever imagine 20 years ago that someday you'd have the honor of serving as a cabinet secretary who had to issue a warning to some morons who'd gone viral for wearing their Apple Vision Pros while driving a cyber truck? <laughs> The future is now, right? I mean, and I got to tell you, I mean, I don't know what was going on in that video. I don't even know if it was real. I just know that anytime I see something like that, I just feel the need to remind everybody there is no car that you can go by today that doesn't require you to have your eyes on the road and your hands on the wheel. There's some really fancy stuff. There's some cool tech. It's great. It is designed to supplement the driver, not replace the driver. For God's sake, watch the road. Don't check your email. Don't do whatever that guy was doing in that video. Just keep your eye on the road. It's that simple. It doesn't seem like it's a it's a hard warning. Um, all right, last question. So Emily and I have a, a toddler who's three. Uh, we now have a two month old as well. Congratulations. Um, thank you. I no longer know what it's like to not feel tired. Um, you guys have twins. I cannot imagine handling two at once the entire time <laughs> uh, while one of you is transportation secretary. How has that been? <laughs> Uh, so it's a challenge. I mean, yeah, we became parents to twins uh, on about 24 hours notice. Um, and That's tough and also, I don't know if every adoptive parent has had this uh, experience, but the advice we got from our agency was actually not to set everything up and have the room ready to go and everything like that uh, because of, of, of just the emotions around the false starts. And we definitely had had false starts as, as many adoptive parents do. Uh, so every, <laughs> everything changed literally overnight for us. Uh, it's as you know, it's the best and hardest thing in the world. Uh, and uh, as I'm sure you also know, um, you really learn just how much you count on your spouse. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, Chasten's traveling a lot too. Uh, you know, he, uh, uh, he, he's been in demand as a speaker, his, his, his book did very well. And, and uh, uh, so, uh, in fact, today I happen to be on, on uh, solo dad duty while he's traveling. Pretty soon I'll, you know, I'll be looking at a bridge or a tunnel somewhere and the reverse will be true. Um, and, you know, you figure it out. But, uh, uh, yeah, you really, the two, look, we don't know it any other way, right? We, we only know what it's like to have twins. But I, I get the sense that it is more than 2x 
uh, as are <laughs> as demanding as one because you got the one interfering with the other one while you're trying to trying to do your thing, especially around bath time. But again, oh, it's, bath it, time it's is tough. The solo this in the solo <laughs> parenting when you have to do that, that's that's really tough because then you're out. Yeah, because you only have like <laughs> ten seconds right to get the diaper on the one kid while they're on their way out of the tub before you got the other kid that you got to take care of. It, it is it is three D chess out there. You um you had a recent post that that connected with me in the most visceral way. Uh, you asked. Just how deeply can the Frozen soundtrack get ingrained in your brain's subroutines before it's permanently displacing essential knowledge? And is there anything you can do about this? I want to know if you figured that out yet because Charlie was screaming and singing Let It Go in his crib at 5.30 a.m. yesterday while I was trying to prepare for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, at least the, the music that that they're getting toddlers addicted to now is is better music. I think that's objectively true. better music than what was going around when, when when we were little for the most part. So we got that going for us. I mean, that's the real thing. I'm I'm driving along. I have to I have to play Let It Go for the nineteenth time, and I'm like, you know, there's actually there's a lot of depth to this song, right? And uh, but uh, uh, yeah, of course, it's also harder because they they know what song they want to hear but they don't know how to explain it to me. So mm. like if they just say play Snowman, I know which song to go for. <laughs> but if they say play Castle, as they demanded that I do this morning in the band, I don't know which song on the Frozen soundtrack Castle means. I, I, there's a castle involved in I think most of the, I, I don't know. As far as what knowledge it displaces, I used to know something about chemistry, not a lot, but like in high school, like I learned chemistry, that's gone. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that that's coming out of the same pocket of my brain that that has now been permanently invaded by the by the frozen soundtrack, which now also you will find, even when your kids are not around, will be playing in your mind at the most unexpected and inappropriate times when you're trying to concentrate on something else. Constantly, constantly. And the other day we were driving to school and and Charlie was like, I was like, oh, we're going to play another Hot Wheels song now, the Cars soundtrack again. And he was like, dad, can we have peace and quiet and just chat? And I was like, Ooh. okay, great. But then careful <laughs> wow. what you wish for, because then there was about 40 questions on the way to school. <laughs> and, and hey, you'll I'll take it. Yeah, you'll get into that. And then you get to explain all kinds of things. Um, That's true. Oh, I'm already out of my depth on heavy equipment. I'm like, what's that? I think it's an excavator. What's that? I was like, I don't know, another excavator? What's that? Like, I don't know, man. But you know what? You're the secretary of transportation. You can tell your kids you're in charge of all the excavators. That's I did, and they are not impressed. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> That's good to know. That's good to know. Keeps you humble. Uh, <laughs> secretary Pete Buttigieg, thank you for stopping by Pod Save America, and uh, come back soon. Appreciate you. Thanks. Same here.